So it has become a tradition on this weekend after Thanksgiving for us to worship together all generations celebrating our shared community. And we do this in part by um, also experimenting in our form of worship a little bit. So we actually put on a little play for you. Um, and today's play um, is going to highlight some of our themes of the month, which is democracy. We've been talking about democracy all month. And a lot of the times when we talk about democracy, it comes down to that fundamental right and freedom to vote. And so we often think about democracy just really in terms of voting. But democracy is much more than that. It's government by the people. So democracy is every time we write a letter to our legislator. Democracy is every time our legislative representatives um, take a vote. Um, democracy is every time we march to change laws. Democracy is people um, wrestling with ideas about how to be a union all together. Democracy, I love to think about this, democracy is our postman making sure we could get letters to one another and hear each other's points of view. So democracy our people, is simply a term for saying people come together. And the people in that democracy are you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and me. So today, we're um, bringing to life two different scenes from To Kill a Mockingbird, the beloved American novel. And through that, we're also going to be celebrating the, the civil rights movement and how we've worked to make this a more inclusive society for all. Thank you. Let me start over. Do we have any eight-year-olds in here? Good. So today, in this scene from To Kill a Mockingbird, we will meet Miss Jean Louise Finch. She likes to be called Scout. She lives in a small town in Alabama called Maycomb. In Miss Jean Louise Finch's town, AKA Scout, she, there are people that are disagreeing. In fact, they are really disagreeing. And she's realizing this. They are disagreeing about what it means for people to have equal representation before the law. So, in other words, should people be treated fairly when they do something that is wrong? Now, I know that we try to ask people why they make certain good, certain good or bad choices. But in this case, Scout's community had not learned that yet. They are still learning it. But Scout is the one that we want to pay attention to. She is going to be watching her father Atticus on how he behaves in a situation when most people disagree with you. When I think back on 1932, when I was just eight years old, I can't help but remember the case of Tom Robinson, a brown-skinned man from a good family that lived behind the dump. My brother Jem and I had been getting a lot of teasing due to the fact that my father, Atticus, was his lawyer, defending him against accusations that he committed a horrible crime. One day, during the trial, my brother Jem and I happened upon Mrs. Henry Lafayette Dubose, we both despised her 
because every time she was on the porch when we passed, we would be raked by her wrathful gaze, subjected to ruthless interrogation regarding our behavior, and given a melancholy prediction on what we would amount to when we grew up, which was nothing. You should be in a dress and a camisole, Miss Jean Louise Finch. <laughs> You'll grow up waiting on tables looking like that. That would be a match for your daddy. One Finch waiting on tables while your father works in a courthouse for that. Come on, Scout. Just hold your head up high and be a gentleman. Your father's no better than the trash he works for. Now, Jim had always had a real slow fuse, so I thought that that was the only explanation for what he did after that. On our way home later, he grabbed my baton, ran up into her front yard, and didn't stop until he had cut the tops off of every camellia bush. Daddy, it isn't fair for you to touch Jem. She was calling you names. Scout, you'll have to keep your head up about far worse things. It's not fair, but, well, all I can say is, when you and Jem are grown, maybe you'll look back on this with some compassion and some feeling that I didn't let you down. I have to do what I know is right. Tom Robinson's case is something that goes to the essence of a man's conscience. Scout, I couldn't go to church and worship God if I didn't help that man. Atticus, you must be wrong. How's that? Well, most folks seem to think that they're right and you're wrong. They're certainly entitled to think that. And they're entitled to full respect for their opinions. But before I can live with other folks, I have to live with myself. The one thing that does not abide by majority rule is a person's conscience. The one thing that does not abide by the majority rule is a person's conscience. We know that the town of Maycomb was a divided place. Many of us know that we also live in divided communities. I invite you to reflect with me on the story and the messages it has with us today. I invite you, I invite you to think about how painful name calling can be and how often you hear people called names or names used in insulting or ungenerous ways. In the story, we see Jem attack a quite innocent bush. The bush is not participating in any of this called no names whatsoever. Sometimes it pains us to see people do the wrong things even if they share the similar viewpoints or have the similar morals that we do. When do we see that happen in our life? Atticus said, the only thing that does not abide by majority rule is one's conscience. I wrote an outstanding essay in fifth grade based on this quote. <laughs> but I invite us to think a little bit more about what majority rules even means for us today. 
What does majority rule mean in a country where one candidate party wins the electoral college and the other wins the popular vote? What does it mean to have majority rule when women's place and status in society is still behind men, even though we make up the majority of the population? What does it even mean to have majority rule when people concerned about um, undocumented persons, and they say, we can't deport all 11 million of them, and they're not even the majority. At what number do people become? We have to ask ourselves today about this quote. The only thing that does not abide by majority rule is one's conscience talks about how there is and sometimes these pervading waves that sweep through, judgmental and harsh, unnuanced, that reflect our poorest selves, and how there's often that little voice in our heart, in our gut, in our mind, in the soul of our being, perhaps the spark of the divine that says, but wait, I don't feel comfortable with that. How do you foster that voice? And how do you put that voice in dialogue with its context? How do you decide if that voice is right? or just your opinion. After Jem attacked that bush, his father, Atticus, sent him off to be punished. And what we learn in the book is that his punishment is to go and read every day to the grouchy old woman. And he learns that she is grouchy because every day she lives in great pain and she's dying. What sort of punishment do we need to learn how at last to come together? In this second scene from To Kill a Mockingbird, we are again with Young Scout. Do you remember how people were mad at her and her father Atticus? People were upset because Atticus thought that all people, even those who seem different than us, deserve to be treated nicely. Atticus thinks everyone should follow the same rules. Sadly, some of his neighbors didn't think that. Well, we are now in a courtroom with Scout. The courthouse is where people decide if everyone should follow the same rules. Scout, and in fact the entire town, has been at the courthouse waiting and waiting for hours. And Atticus, it seems, has presented a case that clearly shows Tom Robinson as innocent. Tom Robinson hasn't done anything wrong. We are now waiting with Scout to hear the verdict or the decision by a group of people on whether or not Tom Robinson will go free or will go to jail. We hope to hear the word innocent and not the word guilty. Yep. 
This court will come to order. I shut my eyes. Judge Taylor was saying something, and his gavel was in his fist, but he wasn't using it. Dimly, I saw Atticus pushing papers from the table into his briefcase. He snapped it shut and went to Tom Robinson. Atticus put his hand on Tom's shoulder as he whispered something to him. Atticus took his coat off the back of his chair and pulled it over his shoulder. Then he left the courtroom, but not by his usual exit. He must have wanted to go home the, the short way, because he walked quickly down the middle aisle toward the south exit. I followed the top of his head as he made his way to the door. He did not look up. Someone was punching me, but I was reluctant to take my eyes from the people around me and from the image of Atticus's lonely walk down the aisle. Miss Jean Louise? I looked around. Everyone was standing. Everyone around me and on the balcony across from me, everyone was on their feet. Reverend Skye's voice was as distant as Judge Taylor's. It's Jean Louise, stand up. Your father is passing by. Scout and Jim were so certain that Tom Robinson would be innocent and go home. In what ways do you hope desperately against the odds? How powerful is it in your life to hope beyond reason. How would you name the feelings that rose in you seeing Atticus walk out of this room? What do children learn by watching the examples of the grown-ups? What did it mean to you to know in the story that all the African Americans, all the black people in the room, stood for Atticus, stood to show him respect and love and community. In this story, Atticus, one, that sense of connection and friendship, belonging, perhaps, with the African-American community. And there were white people in that town who stood by him and supported him and thanked him, but there were many who were really angry at him. So I ask you, do you think Atticus belonged more with the black community or more with the white community? 
can you belong to more than one? Are you allowed to? Can you belong to both fully? And how does that get decided anyway? Is it possible for one person to create a bridge between two different people, a bridge that not only they but others can cross? Do we look for such bridges in our lives? Atticus took this case at great cost. People called him names and kind of bullied him. And worse, most terrifying to him, they bullied his children. And that made him feel really scared and sick. And he knew it was going to happen. But he thought taking this case and standing with Tom Robinson was the right thing to do, so he did it anyway. I'm always struck, though, once I learned a little bit more about the civil rights movement, that Atticus, on this day and in the book, says, I've done all the work here that I can do. And he doesn't try to file an appeal or claim that this was a mistrial. He was not a Thurgood Marshall, whom you'll learn about someday, I hope. But he wasn't like so many lawyers in the civil rights movement who just kept fighting and fighting in different courtrooms until finally innocent people like Tom Robinson got to go free and the rules changed. And so Atticus had a choice. He made the choice to go so far but not further. How do we make those own choices, our own those choices in our own lives? Where do you see yourself in this story? Where would you have placed yourself if you were in the courtroom that day? May we know ourselves and our role models and find ways to live lives of integrity and solidarity. May we work to create a greater sense of safety and belonging. <laughs>